Which, which brings us, Katie, if we can, I want to talk about warfare, how we've got to evolve. Please, guys, it's so true. And I've been trying to teach you through this channel how to evolve into the higher revelations, the deeper things of Scripture in warfare. And that's what Alan and I are here to do today. Lead on, my brother, lead on. I, I've, I've, got this, I've got this book right here that I quote extensively. This is a 100-year-old copy, more than 100 years now. Wow. It's called Defenseless America by Hudson yeah. Maxim. And Hudson oh Maxim was a chemist. He was an inventor. He invented smokeless gunpowder, admired by the likes of Thomas Edison. And in 1914, he saw a simmering conflict brewing on the horizon that he was trying to wake America up. And in 1915, he published this book to try to get us to understand that there's a war coming. He's referring to the Great War, World War I, that yeah. we were wholly unprepared for. And he says something in there that just I, I just have to quote to you. He says, passivism has ringed the nose of the American people and is leading them blind and unknowing oh. to the slaughter. God. And when I, when I read that, that jumped off the page at me and said, that is the American church. Wow. Passivism has ringed the nose of the American church. Well, we think we can get by without engaging in spiritual warfare. Mm. And so this is the journey we go through in the book. One of my favorite chapters is called The Evolution of Warfare. And mm. we're all familiar with Paul's magnum opus of the Ephesians 6 armor of God, where he walks us through this beautiful picture of these spiritual weapons. And what Paul does, he begins to talk about righteousness. He begins to talk about faith, mm. peace, the mm. blessed hope, a, a myriad of things. But here's what we fail to realize. The church at Ephesus was the most well-known and well-taught church in ancient times. Mm. This, is where, this is where Jesus' mother went to church. This is wow. where the apostle John pastored. This is where Timothy pastored for a time. This was a who's who of ministry. They had good teaching. They had all of these things. They had righteousness. They had truth. They had all these things, but they didn't know how to use them like weapons. Uh, and Paul says, finally, my brethren, put on the armor of God. That word finally is very important. Mm. He says, most importantly. Now, if you know anything about the book of Ephesians, he's discussed some pretty important things. Yeah. Our redemption, our position in Christ. Mm. But then he gets to the end and he says, most importantly, how in the world is the armor of God more important, generally speaking, than our redemption? Well, generally speaking, it's not more important, but he wasn't mm. speaking generally. He was speaking prophetically. He was speaking to them at that moment, and prophetically, they already understood their redemption. They were saved. What they needed in that moment was to be equipped with weapons. They need to learn how to turn the revelations that they had received into weapons Jesus. against the enemy. And so this is, this is key, because some of you, you understand righteousness, but you don't know how to use it like a weapon. Oh, oh my God. Here, say it again. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> you understand righteousness, but you don't know how to use it like a weapon. Remember, oh, our, oh. you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So you have the gospel of peace, but you don't know how to use it like a weapon. Wow. You have a helmet of salvation, but you don't know how to use it like a weapon. And so most importantly right now, this is a word for you. Here, here How do we turn it into weapon? I have here okay. something everyone's probably familiar with. This is what you call nunchucks. nunchucks. These, are, these are now considered to be weapons. Originally, they were not weapons. These are agricultural tools. And when the Japanese had oppressed the Okinawan people, they would not allow them to have traditional weapons. So the Okinawans had to learn to take, listen to this, agricultural items, tools. This was used to separate wheat from chaff, by the way. That's what ah. this was for. They had to learn to take what they were using for agriculture and turn it into a weapon if they wanted to overthrow the forces of darkness in their oh life. Oh, my gosh. Oh, come on. So when, we, when we're talking about come the on. weapons of our warfare, how do we turn righteousness into a weapon? How do we turn anything into a weapon? Yeah, give us some, give us some practical examples because I'm about to explode up here. here here's, here's a good example, by the way, before I get spiritual. Here in North Carolina, I don't know if it's still the law, but there was a time when brass knuckles were illegal. They might, they might still be. But there were shops that still sold them legally because they didn't sell them as a weapon. They sold them as a paperweight. 
Oh. What, a, what an interesting way to get around the law. It's not a weapon. It's a Ooh. paperweight. And But what the church has done is we have taken the weapons of our warfare and we have turned them into agricultural tools in order to maintain the little truck church system that we mm. have right now. So mm. we've taken the prophecy that says they will turn their plow, their swords into plowshares and we have we have applied it too soon and we're now trying to maintain instead of advance the kingdom of God. Come on. And so when we're talking about the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, many in the church are using that today to get their own personal healing or you know to to maintain the peace in their personal lives. I love the anointing that's on your life, Katie. You have an anointing for the miraculous, for healing, for deliverance. But as you've shared with me, it was for the purpose of releasing men and women to service, mm. to advance the kingdom. Yeah. So how do we change righteousness into a weapon? We turn it from inward. We turn it outward against the enemy, which yes. we can talk more about in a minute. I don't want to. Oh. I don't want to filibuster this. <laughs> No, filibuster away. I mean, guys, like just the simplicity of, you know, if the devil's attacking you, accusing you of something, there is no condemnation of Christ and you are made righteous in him. So what do you do when the devil's saying, well, you're doing this and you're doing that? You come back and you say, guess what, devil? I made righteous in Christ. You cannot accuse me. All yes. the accusations are under the blood. You know, you have to attack with the truth of the word. You have to use it and swing it like a weapon instead of just having it be head knowledge. Well, I, I, there's a chapter called the avenging prayer, which I think has been totally lost in the church today. Mm. And we go into depth. I open it up by giving you history of a great general of the faith named Watchman Nee. Some of your audience may Ooh, have heard his yeah. name, but you don't know mm -hmm. his story. I actually go into detail about his story where much of his revelation came in prison. He actually died in prison for his faith. But he released a revelation that I uncover in this book about how it is the job of the believer to bring an accusation against the enemy. The accuser of the brethren has been coming against you night and day, and yet most Christians say nothing about it. When it is the divine command of God and prerogative of the believer to go before the throne of heaven and to accuse Satan and demand reparations from the forces of darkness. And if you're not doing that, then you're wasting heaven's time. Jesus said when he gave the, the parable of the, of the widow who went before the righteous judge or the unrighteous judge again and again and again, he said, will I find faith like this in the last days? Mm. Jesus is looking for people who will go before his throne and accuse Satan. You need to go before the throne of God and say, Satan has come after me. He has stolen this from me. And I demand restitution in the oh, name yeah. of Jesus. I demand the court of heaven rule against him night and day. And if you'll do that, you'll begin to see supernatural restoration begin. And I walk yes. you through verses you can use in yeah. scripture in yes. order to come, bring vengeance against the enemy. Yeah, guys, you know, look, if if you don't go to court to file a claim against someone who's cheated you, exactly. you're never going to have a legal decree released against that person to force them to pay you back. So yeah. if you don't do that to the devil, you're not going to get your stuff back. So not automatic. You, Right, it's not automatic. We're supposed to rise up and become warrior people in this earth. You know, we're even supposed to use Goliath's own weapons against him. Oh my goodness. Yeah, come Let's on. Let's hear about that. So he, here's, here's what Revelation 12, 12 says. It says that in the last days, Satan will know that his time is short and that he will begin to come down in great wrath. And here's the insight into Satan's kingdom that you need to understand before we talk about Goliath's sword. Satan is ramping up his attacks against believers. Oh my gosh. That means that spiritual warfare evolves. It is changing. That we mm. are going to face an intensity that even the Apostle Paul didn't have to face in his days as this gets ramped up. That's why the revelation of spiritual warfare must evolve. Scripture is our foundation. We cannot move away from the foundation of Scripture. But even when you look at Ephesians chapter 6, he lists seven pieces of armor, some, some say six, some say seven. But 10 years earlier in 1 Thessalonians, he, he lays out the armor of God and he only lists two. So in 10 years, that revelation evolved wow. from two pieces of armor to seven pieces of armor. <laughs> oh, but then on. when you recognize that Paul is quoting the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah mm. wasn't referring to Roman armor, 
Isaiah was referring to Babylonian armor. So Paul updated the revelation based on current oh. military technology. Come on. So, so as military technology evolves, we have an opportunity to update our revelation of spiritual warfare. Uh, okay, guys, listen. The, are you paying attention? This is a this is incredible stuff. Okay, like uh, Alan just basically preached my life message, which is <laughs> Ephesians three ten. It says the purpose is that through the church, the complicated, many sided wisdoms mm -hmm. of God in all of its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to who the angelic rulers and authorities, principality and powers. It's like we're supposed. Yeah to have multi-sided, innumerable, um, infinite varieties of revelation, warfare, yes. weapons, insight to use against who? The principalities and the powers. That's exactly We've got right. to that's, grow. That's exactly, that's why one of the reasons I go through the history of prayer for the last century in the book, mm. and I go through what prayer was like in the 1800s and how it evolved in the early 1900s, yeah. and then how it evolved with the happy hunters in the 70s and 80s into the commanding prayer. We go, yeah. through, we go through all of that, which, which brings us to these, how we've got to have many and varied weapons and how, how it evolves. Yeah. What, what the Spirit of God showed me was that the Sunday school lesson about David and Goliath is not sufficient for the church today. David did not completely slay the enemy with the, with the stone. Mm. The Bible said that after he hit him with the stone, yeah, that he on. went and unsheathed Goliath's own sword and then separated his head from his shoulders and slew him. Whew. So what this, what this means is, is that David used, now get this, enemy technology. Come on to overthrow the forces of darkness. Yeah. We see this all throughout scripture and all throughout history where God takes what the devil meant for evil and turns it around and use it against the enemy. Yes. So God, Haman, inspired Ooh. by Satan, constructs gallows to hang God's people. Mm. And when, before he can have a ribbon cutting ceremony, he's hanging from the gallows himself. Come Satan on. devises the most torturous means imaginable, crucifixion and mm. uses it to try to take out the Son of God. And that very emblem itself becomes a symbol of hope and salvation <sighs> for on. generations and thousands of years afterward. Come and on. today we have media. We have these devices in our hands that every mm. single one of you right now is utilizing. And God wants you to use, this is Goliath's sword, modern yes. technology to use that weapon against the enemy. That's why you're watching this. You need to comment. You need to hit the thumbs up bu button if you haven't already. Yeah. Share this message, because when you do, you're using it as a weapon against the enemy. Come on. I want you guys to think about that. It's like the Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He's using the airwaves to, to do false news and false promoting and to create lies and to, to basically brainwash people into believing things that aren't happening and to believe things that they want them to believe. We've got to take over the airwaves and use Goliath's weapon against himself. That's why it's important, like you said, share the broadcast, subscribe to channels like Encounter Today, uh, Katie Susan Ministries, and to spread the good word. I think that that is one of the biggest things we can do to build our weaponry.